Welcome to AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Foreign Service Protective Association. Each week, we deliver informative health and wellness topics you want to know about. So be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast channel. And if you have any questions about content discussed in this episode, ask them at AFSPA Live. Our live Q&A sessions streaming every last Thursday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on YouTube.com slash AFSPACARES. Now here's your host, Chief Operating Officer Kyle Longton. Hi, and welcome to another episode of AFSPA Talks. I'm your host, Kyle Longton, and I want to thank you for joining us for today's episode. Before we get into today's topic, I just want to remind you that AFSPA offers a wealth of events for our members to participate in, and most of those these days are taking place virtually. You can go to afspa.org slash events to see our full event calendar and register for upcoming events. I'll also point you to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash afspacares to find recordings of recent events, including video of these podcast episodes, if you prefer that as your medium rather than just the audio. You can find now a recording of our annual meeting that took place on March 3rd, and other past episodes will are also found on there. Now to get to today's episode, we've talked a lot about infertility over the last year. Some of that's been just a general interest from our members, and some of it was about new benefits that we offered starting in 2023. We'll come back to that in just a moment, but I do want to point you back to the episodes that we did over the summer on infertility and mental health, as well as some member journeys about infertility and and how they approached it. Some people through adoption, others through um, art procedures, including um, in vitro fertilization to grow their own families. Those are really moving stories, and I encourage you to go back and listen to those. And um, we also did a live episode with some um, members and some some friends of mine who um, shared their stories with us live and answered questions. So we'll put some links to that in the show notes to uh, give you an opportunity to go back and listen to those. But it is the month of April and the last week of the month, starting with April 23rd, will be Infertility Awareness Week. And so we wanted to bring just some information back to our membership about our benefits, but also just about infertility and how it's diagnosed its causes, and the the various treatments that are available by sharing with you again an interview that we did in the fall. Come to that in just a moment, but I do want to talk for a moment about our benefits. So in 2023, OPM gave federal plans the opportunity, they opened the door just a little bit and gave us the opportunity to propose um, coverage for the first time for assisted reproductive um, treatment procedures. So art, art procedures, including artificial insemination, and in vitro fertilization, those being sort of the most popular forms and and most um, effective forms in some cases, particularly the IVF of um, having children when there are issues and questions of infertility. Now, the Foreign Service Benefit Plan was one of only four plans and the only national fee-for-service plan to offer a benefit. It is a start. Um, It is $5,000 per person per calendar year to cover services, including lab tests, supplies, and drugs related to art procedures, such as artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization. Um, And and here with the artificial insemination, we're usually talking about IUI. There are other procedures that are covered, um, and those are listed in the plan brochure, but those are, as I said, the the most popular ones we see um, utilized the most, and, and that I can tell you from my own experience of of friends and family that that, um, have been effective in many cases. A couple things I want to put here at the top of the episode. The first is that for FSBP members who are seeking to utilize this benefit and seek um, uh, coverage in the United States, you must go to an Institutes of Excellence infertility provider. Um, If you're outside the United States, that's okay. Um, Any provider that you you vet and choose we can provide coverage for, but in the U.S., it is only the Institutes of Excellence, and, and we'll talk about this during the episode with one of our medical directors um, about why uh, why are we using that that network, um, those institutes, and, and what, what sets them apart, so listen for that. The other thing that I want to make sure that I mention is that prior approval is required for members 
using infertility uh, benefits, whether they're in the US or overseas. This is one of the few benefits where we do require prior approval outside the United States as well. And I'll put this in the show notes, but for that prior approval, you have to call uh, 1-800-923-2220 um, to, to speak with one of the, the dedicated um, care managers who works only on these uh, infertility cases. They, they're not dedicated just to foreign service benefit plan, but they do this nationwide. This is this is their expertise, so you can reach out to them. Also, if you're just sort of at the beginning of your journey and you're not sure what the steps are or where to turn, we also are offering access to uh, what's known as a fertility advocate. Uh, and that, that fertility ad advocate can be reached by members at 833-415-1709. So there are a lot of places to turn um, and, and get some more information, both about what services are available and what the coverage is, and then how to go about getting coverage for those services. So please utilize these programs, but please keep in mind that prior approval is required both in the United States and outside the United States. Um, so those are the, the things that I wanted to um, emphasize. The other thing I want to mention, and this is this is publicly available, so I can say it, um, is that we are looking at our benefits for 2024. And so are a lot of other plans. One of the things that OPM is requiring of all federal health plans next year is that they provide coverage for artificial insemination and that they provide coverage at least for um, drugs related to in vitro fertilization. So the plans are working on that right now. We are considering what that will look like. Um, and so there will be a change in this going into 2024. Um, that specific information plan by plan, including from us, won't be available until we get OPM approval sometime later in the summer. But I encourage you, if this is an issue that's important to you and you're thinking about it, watch for updates to that information um, for the fall and Keep in mind that those coverage changes will not be in effect until 2024, whatever is approved and offered by these plans. So without any further ado, I want to introduce um, our, our guest today. And again, this is a replay of an episode that we did in November. It's an interview with Dr. Jordan Pritzker, who is an MD, but also has an MBA and is a um, FACOG, which is part of the College of Gynecologists and a board certified OBGYN. He's been in private and academic practice in New York uh, for many years until accepting a position at Aetna in 2020. He has served as a New York market medical director, senior medical director for the New England region, and is currently an executive medical director in medical policy and operations. Dr. Pritzker oversees a special case pre-certification unit in which women's health and infertility, gender affirming surgery, out of country transport, Gene-Based Cellular and Innovative Therapies, or GSIP, and the Transplant National Medical Excellent Programs are managed. Dr. Prisker has served on the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists Committee on Health, Economics, and Coding for over 20 years, and served on the American Medical Association CPT Code Editorial Panel for eight years and various other AMA committees and work groups. Dr. Prisker has so much knowledge just at his fingertips um, and I'm so delighted to be able to share this episode with you all again. So please tune in um, and stay tuned at the end of the episode again for a bit more information uh, about where you can find resources. Also check the so show notes for that information. Without any further ado, here's our interview. For the first time in 2023, FSBP will be offering coverage for art procedures up to $5,000 per person per year. Now, what does that mean? What exactly is covered? How is it covered? Where can you get these procedures covered? And when is it covered? Um, you know, what, what sorts of prior authorization is needed and what conditions have to be met as well? Those are some of the questions I hope that we can answer with today's episode. And as I said, we're coming to you midweek because we were able to um, book an expert as our guest today. And that expert is Jordan Pritzker. Jordan Pritzker is an MD, an M. BA and an FACOG. He's a board certified OBGYN who was in private practice and academic practice in New York until accepting a position at Aetna in 2010. 
He has served as a New York Market Medical Director, Senior Medical Director for the New England region, and is currently an Executive Medical Director in Medical Policy and Operations. Dr. Pritzker oversees the Special Case Pre-Certification Unit in which women's health, infertility, gender-affirming surgery, out-of-country transport, gene-based cellular and innovative therapies, or GSIT, and the Transplant National Medical Excellent Excellence Programs are managed. Dr. Pritzker has served on the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Committee on Health Economics and Coding for over 20 years, and served on the American Medical Association CPT Code Editorial Panel for eight years, and various other AMA committees and work groups. We are very excited to have him here today to answer some of our questions. Dr. Pritzker, welcome to Aspa Talks. Thank you for having me. So we're, we're talking, we've got you here today because we're talking about art procedures and they have opened up options for people who wish to grow their families. And there are people who wish to have a child without a partner. There are those who are in same-sex partnerships and rely on art procedures for growing their families. And there are people in heterosexual relationships who have difficulty conceiving. Are there common conditions or reasons that result in a diagnosis of infertility and might might cause people in the heterosexual relationships to, to turn to art procedures? So if I may, I'm going to step back first and, and provide you with a definition of infertility. And this is as we publish in our clinical policy bulletins. So for Aetna, a person is considered infertile if they're unable to conceive or produce conception after one year of egg sperm contact when the female is attempting conception is under 35 years of age, or after six months of egg sperm contact when the female attempting conception is 35 years of age or older, egg sperm contact can be achieved by frequent sexual intercourse or through monthly timed sperm inseminations. These could be intrauterine inseminations, intracervical inseminations, or intravaginal inseminations, which can be done by the persons themselves. This definition applies to all individuals, regardless of their sexual orientation or the presence or availability of a reproductive partner. And of course, infertility may also be established by demonstration of the disease of a reproductive tract, such that timed egg sperm uh, contact would not be effective. So um, that being said, when we think about infertility, we think about the relationships of of the egg and the sperm in achieving uh, the pregnancy. And by and large, there are three, uh, three different ways to think about this, um, the causes of infertility. One third of the time, it, it's usually a female factor. <clears throat> Another third of the time, it, it's usually a male factor. <clears throat> and uh, the other third of the time, it can be both. And more than often about 10%, um, are what we classified as unknown infertility causes. Mm. So when looking at the male infertility, um, we, we think about anatomical issues versus hormonal issues. And of course, the, the anatomical issues are making sure that the reproductive tract is intact, that there's no blockage of the, um, the sperm ducts, um, that the patient has an adequate body temperature. We all know that the location of the testicles is outside the body because it requires a lower normal body temperature than the core body temperature. So people who, um, uh, men who have careers that, that lead to um, tight clothing and, and in high temperature conditions often can be infertile. And, and again, other um, anatomical things like varicoceles, these are, are swollen veins around the spermatic cord can also lead to decreased sperm production and that can lead to infertility. The other issues can be related to hormonal issues. <clears throat> and hormonal issues by and large lead to low sperm counts and also can affect the ability of the sperm to move, their motility um, and, and how they will um, be able to, to meet an egg and cause conception to happen. <clears throat> Another issue with sperm is the shape of the sperm. And much of this is genetically related. Um, we, we know that a good number of individuals may produce sperm that are not normal shaped, and therefore those sperm would not be able to, to cause the conception to happen. So for male infertility, um, 
the, the basic evaluation would start with a sperm count. I mean, it, it's that simple. And a physical examination of the male partner of the sperm donor, um, if there is an abnormality noted within the sperm count. So that's, that's one third of infertility. The, the second third of infertility falls into the female factor issues. Um, the, the primary concern with female infertility, of course, is age. We know that as a woman ages, her fertility decreases. And there's a number of, of significant age milestones that a woman would reach um, during which the fertility would decrease. And this is really all related to the depletion of the eggs within the ovaries. So we know that women in their early 20s, 86% of the time can achieve a pregnancy within 12 months. Hmm. By the time they're 30 years old, <clears throat> their ability to achieve pregnancy decreases to about 63%. By 40 years of age, it's down around 30%. And once one reaches 45 years of age, it's highly, highly unlikely that an individual will achieve pregnancy. You know, and, and we all know of people who in their late 40s, early 50s had, had those surprise babies, but those are, are very rare. Um, so for female infertility, um, we consider what the cause may be, um, and it really falls into two different categories, um, anatomical infertility versus hormonal infertility. And the anatomical infertility, as you think about the reproductive tract and, and the ovaries releasing an egg every month, if there's scarring around the ovaries, if there is infections that may block the, the path from the ovary to the fallopian tube. There's also other conditions like endometriosis. Endometriosis is when we find the lining of the uterus growing outside of the uterus in the pelvis, and that can cause adhesions. It can cause certain chemicals to be released which can affect the ovary's ability to ovulate every month. And it can, and even in individuals who do ovulate, those chemicals can keep that egg from being able to be fertilized. Um, next in line anatomically would be the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tubes can be subjected to infection or in, any other kinds of blockage that can occur in the tubes. From there, the egg traveling from the ovary through the fallopian tube would enter the uterus if an individual has uh, fibroids, that could be blocking the ability of a fertilized egg to implant, or there could be polyps, these benign growths from the glandular tissue of the lining of the uterus that could also affect the ability of a fertilized egg to implant. And then there are more rarely anatomical abnormalities, different changes in the, in the uterus that happen developmentally uh, that could also keep uh, pregnancy from implanting, you, you might hear about people having a bicornuate uterus. It actually has two horns to it. Mm. It's not the normal pear-shaped uterus. Or there may be septums uh, in the middle of the uterus where the, where the two tubes embryologically fuse to make the uterus. It may not have been a complete fusion, but much of that is surgically fixable mm. for the individual, and that by and large would lead to a pregnancy. The other anatomical issue it would be vaginal issues. Uh, vaginal infections may uh, impact the ability of the sperm to be able to function or, or cause adhesions and scarring within an individual's vagina. Or then again, the anatomical issues that we can see in people who just aren't able to get pregnant. There are vaginal septums and, and other anatomical things that can happen. Um, beyond the anatomical piece, we have the hormonal piece. And if you really think about the human body, it's pretty complicated how an individual can even exist. Um, when it gets to infertility, <clears throat> we think about the glands within the brain and how they function and stimulate the ovary to produce the eggs every month. And those glands in the brain are the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So those are where the, the hormones are created for the, the body that through the bloodstream get to the ovary to stimulate the growth of the eggs. Um, the primary hormone that we talk about here is follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. So if there is a tumor or some other issue happening within one's brain that would impact the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland that would impact the ability of those glands to produce FSH, follicle stimulating hormone to get to the ovaries. The other hormonal issue is the thyroid gland in our necks. In the front of our necks, we have this gland that control pretty much most of our body functioning, our, our homeostasis. And the hormone from the thyroid, um, if, if there's too much or too little, it can impact the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland 
and keep them from producing enough of the FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone that acts on the ovaries and that would lead to infertility for many individuals. We, we do have ways to, to address that. Um, and in, um, in health insurance evaluation, both of male infertility and female infertility is all part of basic infertility coverage. That includes the physical examinations, all the blood tests, the laboratory tests. Um, for female infertility, the hysterosalpingogram, that's the x-ray of the fallopian tubes to make sure the fallopian tubes are open. Um, there are ultrasounds that may be done to look for the polyps in the uterus or fibroids in the uterus. Um, and even certain medications to treat those medical conditions would all be covered under the basic infertility benefit. The other issues that can impact um, one's ability to get pregnant are, are directly related to the ovaries themselves. They, they may not be responding to the follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and that could be due to a number of factors. Uh, one of which is, is a pretty common condition called polycystic ovary syndrome. And we know that upwards of 6% of the US population has polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, this is a condition where the body just isn't producing appropriate amount of hormones. Um, it can be related to the pancreas where we see insulin resistance and polycystic ovary syndrome individuals can also develop over time type two diabetes, um, gestational diabetes when they do get pregnant. Uh, they can get abnormal hair growth, uh, uh, things related to overproduction of male hormones, of androgen production, like acne and oily skin can occur. Uh, people with polycystic ovary syndrome are also prone to getting more heart disease and high blood pressure, troubles with sleeping, depression, anxiety, um, a number of other issues. Uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, again, can cause ovulation problems with the ovaries. Um, and there are now medi many medications that are, are out to treat polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, one of the common ones that we use is metformin that you may have uh, heard, of, heard of. It's a diabetic drug that works very well. And, and oftentimes individuals with polycystic ovary syndrome who are not ovulating regularly, they may be getting their periods even three or four times a year when you uh, administer the metformin regularly, daily. Uh, their menstrual cycles will come back regularly, and, and, and it's that uh, uh, ovulation event that allows them to get pregnant. It, and I can, and, and I appreciate that you've, you've sort of touched on, because there are so many different, you know, anatomical, as you've outlined, and hormonal potential causes of infertility and the ways that that can be addressed. And, and I've shared on the podcast before in brief sort of my, my, and my wife's um, challenge in, in getting pregnant the first time and, and PCOS was a, a factor and, and metformin played a role in, um, in, in our getting pregnant the first time um, with our, our twins um, when that happened. But, you know, we, we were able to conceive without um, assistant um, assistance or, or art procedures of any kind and and so we didn't have to make the decision as to you know should we go to art procedures or not it, in your practice and your experience is there sort of a typical point after trying these other solutions that you've outlined um at which the patient and doctor decide that an art procedure is the next best step is it is it after that 6 month or 12 month period um or, or are there other factors yeah, by and large it, it usually would be after that 6 or 12 months of egg sperm contact um, and, and during that time, all covered under basic infertility services, usually under the medical benefit, is that evaluation to try mm -hmm. to determine why one is not getting pregnant. And, and if a cause is found in treating that, that particular issue, it's polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, appropriate treatments with metformin and whatnot. If it's a sperm count issue, getting to the uh, male infertility doctors who can address that with appropriate medications, or appropriate surgery. Um, if, if on the hysterosalpingogram of the woman, we find that the fallopian tubes are blocked and, and the blockage is amenable to surgery to open up those fallopian tubes, okay. And if not, and it looks like the person's just not gonna get pregnant because their fallopian tubes are blocked, then it's time to move on to, to advanced reproductive technologies like IVF. Um, so, so much of the process of the evaluation of one not getting pregnant um, would lead to the need for the advanced reproductive technologies, um, IVF and, and, and infertility medications. And, 
So before we go much further in our discussion, I wonder if I could ask you to provide a brief explanation of the the various common art procedures and, and sort of what what each one means. And I've got I've got the list here of exactly what we we are covering and what's what's in our brochure. And so um, I wonder if if you could sum up each one in just a, a few sentences. And, and I'm happy to go through the list and and um, and guide us through that if that's all right. So if it's the same list you provided me with, I can go through the list. Uh, the first right. one is artificial insemination. Are, are we on the same list? Uh, we got the same list. Great. So art artificial insemination is also called intrauterine insemination. That's where a sperm that has been specially prepared is physically inserted either into the individual's vagina or, or on the cervix or into the uterus itself. Uh, and, and that is the vaginal approach is usually performed by the individual themselves, um, but getting into the intrauterine, it's usually in the physician's office. They, and a general uh, obstetrician gynecologist can provide that service. It doesn't necessarily have to be with an infertility specialist uh, doing the artificial inseminations. The, the next one on the list that I have is in vitro fertilization. Um, in vitro fertilization is a little bit, uh, is a lot more involved. And, and interestingly, just to level set, I, I like statistics and thinking about the number of procedures that are done in the United States. Uh, the CDC reports, uh, all the infertility clinics in the country report through the Society of Advanced Reproductive Technologies to the CDC. And every year the CDC tallies up the literally the success rates, the, the singleton pregnancies, twin pregnancies, just a, a plethora of information. Um, easy for anyone to see if they're considering uh, infertility providers to see how they compare to each other. You just internet search on CDC IVF. Uh, the last uh, year's reported uh, that is posted on the CDC website is 2019. And it's interesting to note that 330,000 IVF cycles were done in 2019. Um, 67,000 of those were in individuals over 40 years of age. And of those 300,000 IVF cycles, 78,000 deliveries were achieved, which were 83,000 babies born. So we know that at least 5,000 of those deliveries were either twins, triplets, and whatnot. Um, about 2% of babies in the United States are born by IVF now. Wow. So the actual process of IVF, of in vitro fertilization, it is usually performed by an infertility doctor. They will give the, the patient specific medication early in the menstrual cycle that will stimulate the ovaries to produce a number of eggs, uh, what we call oocytes. Um, about quote unquote mid cycle, um, after measuring certain blood tests, estradiol levels, measuring the size of the eggs that are growing with ultrasound, the infertility doctor will give the patient um, a shot of HCG. That's the hormone that the body makes to cause ovulation to happen. But shortly after that shot, which is meant to mature those eggs, they will go in and, and do the retrieval. They will go in in the office setting, ambulatory surgery setting, and usually through the wall of the vagina under ultrasound guidance, literally place a needle into the, into the ovaries and try to extract, suction out the eggs that they can get. The average, uh, the average IVF cycle will obtain about 12 eggs. Um, and we know that uh, down the, the fertilization process that usually only two or three eggs will become fertilized. Mm. Uh, the other eggs just may not be ready to get fertilized. So we have the, the egg retrieval, the fertilization itself. And then we go back to the time where we called it a test tube baby. Um, the uh, eggs are put on a, a sterile Petri dish with certain fluids. The embryologist in the infertility doctor's office will isolate the best looking eggs um, and they will introduce the sperm near the eggs and watch and, and hope that the egg, that, that the sperm will break through the, the, the outer shell of the egg and fertilize the egg. And from there, it's a matter of incubating those fertilized eggs um, through a number of days and, and until those eggs are, are developed into what we call our blastulas. And usually by day five or six, those are implanted into the uh, uterus uh, to allow it to grow. Some cycles, the eggs will be frozen 
or the embryos will be frozen for later use. Sometimes um, there'll be needs for testing the embryos to look for certain genetic conditions. And uh, in, in those cycles, the infertility doctors, embryologists will usually freeze the embryos. Uh, they'll first take a couple of the cells, you know, as these embryos literally divide, they, they first divide from one cell to two cells, to four cells, to eight cells, to 16 cells. And along the ways, they will take a couple of those cells and send them to the laboratory to be genetically tested to see if there might be a genetic abnormality. You know, people with hemophilia or sickle cell disease or, or certain other neurological diseases we can now test for. Um, diseases that we know are autosomal dominant that are carried through one or the other parent, whether it's in the sperm or the egg, that we can test for them. And also conditions that are autosomal recessive, that a person may only be partially carrying it, but if you and your partner both carry it, then there's a good chance that the embryo could have it. And we can test for that before the embryo was placed back in the uterus. So placed in the embryo in the uterus is called embryo transfer. Um, it's also um, called uh, a number of other procedures, but all really meaning the same thing, embryo transfer. There are some older techniques, gamete intrafallopian tube, also called GIFT, and zygote intrafallopian tube transfer, ZIFT, which really aren't done today. Um, those were done back in the 80s and 90s, not doing the, the transvaginal embryo transfers because it was thought that getting the eggs, the fertilized eggs into the fallopian tubes led to a better implantation into the wall of the uterus. So GIFT and ZIP really aren't done that much anymore unless there's a specific reason that, that somebody's cervix would not allow for an embryo transfer to be able to be performed. There's a term on the list called intracytoplasmic sperm injection. This is called ICSI. Um, that's done uh, for fertilizing the egg. Uh, there are certain conditions of the sperm for which they just, we know they just won't fertilize an egg. Mm -hmm. Very low sperm counts. You can't get enough sperm up next to the egg, even doing the IVF in the, uh, uh, in the infertility office by the embryologist, they can't get enough of the eggs close enough, uh, enough of the sperm close enough to be able to get through the wall of the eggs. Um, there's other uh, uh, conditions, you know, individuals who have had, a, had two cycles of trying to get IVF to happen and they just can't get the sperm to get into the egg. Those you would want to literally inject the sperm through the shell of the egg so that the sperm is within the egg. Um, and just to note that even performing ICSI doesn't necessarily increase the, the outcomes of IVF that much. But for those sperm that just don't have the ability to get into the egg, it, it's helping them pass that barrier of the egg's uh, outer shell. Um, intravaginal insemination, intrauterine insemination, and intracervical insemination uh, we spoke about all as part of artificial insemination. Um, were there any others, Kyle, that we should? That, uh, that's review? everything from my list as well. Um, okay. So. We know what the options are now, um, and it sounds like, I mean, essentially they fall into to sort of two major categories at this point, you know, artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization um, for, from what you've described. How do the, the patient and the doctor determine what sort of the best option is for the, the best outcome um, as they're trying to, to have a baby? So it really comes down to looking at what the cause of the infertility may be and treating those causes, whether it's with medications or surgeries or you know, trying to boost the, the sperm count. Um, from there, if the cause of the infertility is part of that 10% unexplained infertility, by and large, the, the next step is to do the what's called the comprehensive benefit level. You know, we have three levels of the benefit for infertility. The basic infertility benefit is covered under a medical plan, and that's all that testing to see why male or female are not getting pregnant. And then we get to the comprehensive level, uh, which, which is trying medications to really push the ovaries to ovulate. Um, and today that's generally done with either Clomid or another oral medication called Letrozole. Letrozole, you, people may be familiar with the brand name Femera. Um, it's also a treatment of breast cancer. It helps decrease uh, certain hormone levels in the body, uh, which, and infertility, when administered on days uh, three through seven of 
the menstrual cycle can actually force ovaries that normally wouldn't ovulate so easily to ovulate, in, including individuals with polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, by and large, we like letrozole better than Clomid that we've all been using for years um, is because the chance of getting twins with Clomid can be as high as seven or 8%. Wow. And using letrozole, it's down to about 3%. So it really decreases um, the chance of twins pretty significantly. Um, and, and we know that the risks of twins and triplets lead to preterm birth um, and, and pretty significant numbers. You know, the twins ones, uh, normally without, uh, it's just a normal singleton pregnancy, one baby pregnancy, chance of having a baby preterm before 37 weeks is about 11%. And with twins, it's about 50%. And with getting up to triplets, it's well over 90% of the time yeah. people deliver preterm. Um, so for, for the comprehensive infertility benefit, um, we, we look to, to see what the age of the individual is. If they're 38 years of age or younger, then it really behooves the individual to try using, whether it's Clomid or Letrozole. Um, and that would be three cycles. Usually if one is gonna get pregnant, with the comprehensive benefit, um, it, it will happen within three cycles. And usually about 15% success rate per cycle. Uh, so you could imagine 40, 45% success rate with comprehensive and not needing the more invasive IVF cycles. Okay. Well, and, and so I think it sounds like there are a lot of factors that go into sort of weighing the decision, including what what the coverage is, what options are available to the the individuals who are, are seeking to conceive. Um, and, you know, for the first time in, in 2023, the Foreign Service Benefit Plan is offering limited coverage of ART procedures up to $5,000 per person per year. Um, you know, as, as you've noted um, during the podcast, Dr. Pritzker, um, you know, testing prescription drugs and hormone treatments and medical or surgical procedures done to create and enhance fertility have been covered prior to, to 2023 and they're covered, but they're not limited by that $5,000 cap. We're, we're actually talking about art procedures that fall under that $5,000 cap. And for our members in the United States, the benefit is only available when they receive services from the Institutes of Excellence infertility providers. Can you tell us how these providers have been identified and, and essentially you know, why, why just these providers? Sure, so going back to that CDC IVF website, all of the infertility providers have to submit their outcomes data. And we're able to rank their outcomes data um, by who's doing the elective single embryo transfer to try to decrease the risk of premature babies, which lead to uh, you know, very significant um, problems, even with the babies long-term, with, with children long-term. You know, we, we, we haven't heard much about what's going on with Octomom these days, and we know that some of those kids aren't doing that well. Um, so we, we do look to the CDC data to, um, to, to see which of the infertility clinics are, are performing at, at the best outcomes, getting the, the most pregnancies and the most singleton pregnancies. So of the 448 IVF clinics that report, we take the top quartile, the top 100 of the clinics that all participate already with Aetna, and we have designated them as the Institutes of Excellence uh, clinics. And most of these are, are throughout the United States. Uh, most are, are, you know, some are, are focused in the metropolitan centers, the large city centers, but we have pretty much penetration throughout the United States in, in most states where there is a significant amount of the population. All right, and it, it's worth noting um, for, for our listeners um, that, it's, that prior approval is required for art procedures. And that, that applies whether you're seeking to have these services inside the United States or outside the United States. Um, and we recommend that members call 800-410-7778 before scheduling an appointment. And, and I guess that sort of leads to, to one of the questions that I hear from members a lot of times, which is, why is prior approval important? Why is it required? So, so prior authorization is something we call pre-certification. It, it's not meant to be a barrier to care. You know, we, we hear people on the media talking about, oh, they just don't want me to get the treatment. Well, we, we want the correct individual to get the correct treatment with the correct provider, whatever we can, we can help make that happen. You know, so in our prior authorization process, 
we look to see what the specific benefit that the individual has if they're covered and what their level of coverage is. We look to see what procedures the doctors are requesting for the patient to make sure it's the right procedures. You know, we, we look and make sure that the sperm count has been done, we make sure that the doctor did the, the x-ray of the fallopian tubes to make sure that's not the issue. You know, those little, those specific details, um, we check in the prior authorization. And every once in a while, we do find a provider that, that may not have caught a, a laboratory result or, a, or an ultrasound result that would impact the pregnancy. So we're not practicing medicine, but we are checking up to make sure that the requested procedure really is the right procedure for the individual and that it's covered under their insurance benefits. And then for plans who, who have um, preference to institutes of excellence, we're able to help steer the patients to those institutes of excellence, or at least to in-network providers, um, when they may be seeing an out-of-network provider, which has significant cost share to the patient. So we, we can help steer patients to the appropriate providers. Um, and, and also it's a way that we can find out who the patients are that are, are trying to access the infertility benefits so that we can uh, set them up with, with case management or, or any other patient support programs that we may have uh, for the individual. Um, so there, there's much more to it um, than, than just yes, no, you know, get the procedure covered or not. It, yeah. it really is a very important step in healthcare. Absolutely. And it, it can it can make sure that, you know, as you said, the, the coverage is in place because we're we're doing the review. Um, we the the plan and, and Dr. Pritzker and his team are, are doing that review and we're we're applying the the same definition that was mentioned at the top of the interview to all of our members when they're seeking um coverage for art procedures. So keep that in mind and, and make that call early if this is something that you're considering. And and Dr. Prisker, I appreciate you mentioned some of the, the management programs we have to support members. And we the Foreign Service Benefit Plan does have a, a healthy pregnancy program, and we're making some enhancements to that in 2023, including access to a fertility advocate. And that's it, available at no cost for our members. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that advocate may help someone who's thinking about pregnancy? So the advocate can review um, with the patient, you know, certain health issues um, and how to maximize their opportunities to get pregnant. Uh, they can also go over with the patient, their specific resources that they may have. Um, and, and even along the ways in, in the evaluation of, for the pregnancy that help them with billing issues that may come up and, mm -hmm. and how to address them, cost share issues. So the advocates really are a tremendous resource. Excellent. And something else, so someone else to make contact with early in the process as well. Um, so Dr. Prisker, given how many members have asked about coverage for art procedures just in my almost 10 years at ASPA and, and um, well before that as well, I anticipate that this episode of ASPA Talks will be one of our top episodes and one to which members will return in the month and maybe even years ahead. So before we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts to share? Or do you feel like we've missed anything in our discussion? Well, for anybody who is contemplating pregnancy, um, they, they really want to op optimize their health status. You know, um, if, if one is overweight or severely underweight, they need to, to really watch their diet maximize to a, a normal weight. If, if any, anyone should still be smoking or, or vaping, that really uh, can cause significant problems at getting pregnant plus during the pregnancy. So uh, no better way to put it than, than stop smoking, stop vaping. Um, if one has any medical conditions, taking any medications, you want to optimize um, the medical condition and for whatever medications one may be taking, um, speak with your, your doctor, your obstetrician, gynecologist to see if those specific medications could have an impact on, on uh, a pregnancy. Um, and, and if so, then you would want to see if one could change to different medications or at least to know how to manage the pregnancy and watch for, for the effect of that medication on the pregnancy early on. So, you know, good, good healthy living, healthy eating, regular exercise, all the, the standard healthy lifestyles um, when one should really you know, maximize before, before getting pregnant. Excellent reminder. Any time to, to 
follow those preventive measures, stick to medications, but also have those important conversations with with our providers and and um, as about what our plans are, not just our current condition, but what our plans may be and how we can optimize that. Thank you very much, Dr. Pritzker, and thank you for joining us for AFSPA Talks. Members interested in art coverage should refer to the 2023 FSDP brochure pages 44 and 45 for full details. Call 1-800-410-7778 for prior approval. You can also call 1-833-415-1709 to be connected with a fertility advocate. You can learn more about the Institutes of Excellence in Fertility Providers by visiting www.etnainfertilitycare.com. This has been AFSPA Talks, a production of the American Porn Service Protective Association. The views and the opinions shared on this podcast by the hosts and guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent AFSPA or any of its partners. All information offered in this podcast is meant to be educational. Should there be any discrepancy between information offered in this podcast and official plan documents for the Foreign Service Benefit Plan or the other products offered by ASPA, the policy provisions will prevail. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to ASPA Talks to catch our next episode. Please rate and review us on your favorite podcast app and share feedback with us on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn at ASPA Cares. Talk again soon. Thanks for joining us this week on ASPA Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you'll never miss an episode. If you have any follow-up questions about the topics in this episode, join our Ask the Live Q&A session on the last Thursday of every month. We will be streaming live on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at 11 a.m. Eastern Time to answer your questions. Thanks for listening.